turning to Maha Kamal next. Maha has worked in Colorado. She has studied in Colorado, and, and she's been associated with the Colorado Prison Project. She's also, she has been involved with the Council of Ex-Muslims in Britain, where she has written a policy paper. And, uh, on, and uh, she is a designer, and she has been disowned by her parents. So we would love to hear her story. Thank you. Uh, speaking of design, do you have the PDF? Because the fonts aren't loading properly on this. That's fine. Huh? I mean, I do. You'll, you'll get your minute. I won't cut it from your time if you need the minute. So don't worry about it. OK, that. can we do that? I'm so sorry. This is just an OCD thing. It has to be the right font. <laughs> and it has to be Rockwell and Rockwell condensed, or I'm going to lose my shit. <laughs> I will. Um, I'm going to, is it OK if I just walk around because I can't sit here? But then I can't show you the card. You can. You will. Just put up your phone and let me know the... <laughs> you guys can interrupt me. All right, well, while he's setting up, I'm going to ask you a simple question. And I know there's a professor in the room that specializes in human rights law, so I'm on the spot right now. Um, what is international law? What is it? Like, when you think about it, it's not God's law. It can be. Maybe, depending on who's in it. What do you, when, when you think of international law, what do you think? Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay. Anybody else? International Criminal Court. International Criminal Court, yes. Okay, so we've got two. There's one. There's a whole body. There's, there's another... That it, uh huh. Okay, so we've got Universal Declaration of Rights. United, United Nations, okay. ICPR. The ICC. <laughs> there's, there's something for prisoners of conscience, civilian rights. Does this ring a bell? They have two protocols. I think someone just said ICCPR. No, that's not it. Okay, I'll just fill it in for you. It's the Geneva Conventions. All right, so you kind of get an idea that this is a really big body, um, which I would like to get my slides, but <laughs> sorry. So what I'm going to get at, um, the second slide, is that international law is a huge, huge field. Um, I actually specialize in international criminal law, so I did work at the Lebanon Tribunal. Um, but international criminal law is one of three major bodies of international law. Um, and just a heads up, this is going to be more of an academic lecture, so you guys can actually use those notepads that are on your table. Um, and there's two other ones. Uh, there's international humanitarian law, and there's also international human rights law. So here's a second question while we wait for him. What's the difference, do you think, between international humanitarian law and international human rights law? Because you know lawyers love to be very nuanced. Does anyone want to take a guess? Does it have to do with what? With war? Yes, it does. Oh my gosh, this is a great group. Um, international humanitarian law is mostly limited to armed conflict and within the context of armed conflict. And international human rights law is the internet, it's, it's based and founded on the UN Declaration of Human Rights and other agreements and treatises that have to do with human rights. So it's not limited to the context of war. Um, international criminal law is also m much in the line with armed conflict, um, even though we can get into that in another lecture. Um, and so we're going to focus on today is international human rights law. And I want to um, talk a little bit about that and its clash with state-sponsored Sharia law um, and how I don't think that the two um, are compatible in this day and age. Um, and, and this is a, oh gosh, good, it's the right font, I think. <laughs> is this a PDF? Okay, do you think it's going to work with... Did you do that? Oh. Oh my God, it's like God. Um, <laughs> really. Okay, so we just went through this. If we can get to the next slide. 
Um, so let's focus in on international human rights law. Um, it actually has a history in natural rights theory, which was per first proposed by John Locke. Um, and I do get a lot of questions about this. So there's a Western origins, which I like to say Western origins versus Western culture. So yes, John Locke was part of what we'd argue is Western culture or Western origins. But that doesn't necessarily mean that international human rights is a product of Western culture. It just so happened to be part of that geopolitical area. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into this. Um, so that's about the history. So natural rights history, the idea that we have rights that are not like, that we, we've had them, they're natural to us, and it's not something that is supposed to be given to you or that you have to work for it or something like that. Um, the sources, like we talked about, which was really good, I'm very impressed, um, there's treatises and agreements, and there's also jurisprudence and case law, which kind of develops out from the agreements and the treatises. So examples of that would be the International Court of Justice, um, European Court of Human Rights. Um, that's where all of the case law gets built out onto you know, what these different um, rights mean. If you can go to the next slide. Toby. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you do my stuff first? No. <laughs> okay, so one of my favorite professors is actually at the University of Denver, uh, Joseph Corbell School, um, International Relations School. Um, he proposes his idea, which I think has been kind of the main thread um, of this conference, is that there is a relative universality of human rights and not a universal relativity of human rights. Um, and this is where I'm going to get, you can see where I'm going in with this in the Sharia law. So, you know, well, let's get back to this criticism, which I'm going to talk about too with relativists, is that they argue that this is a West, this, this idea of relative universality is actually a Western imposition on different cultures. Um, what he argues, and which I agree with, is that human rights actually did not come from any Western culture. Because if you think about Western culture, it was pretty fucked up. And this is something that I do. Americans swear like sailors. But it was. If you think about it, you've got the Christians, you've got the Romans. They, were, they weren't the most, they weren't the greatest people to live under either. So it's not that, that the idea of that came from Western culture, but it just so happened that we had the social, economic, and political transformations that kind of were the the, the the ideal mix to cause this idea of natural rights or human rights to come out. And what he also argue, argues, and I agree with too, is that this sort of mix to cause natural rights, to cause human rights as a concept to come up can happen in any culture. It just has to be, it's more of a political movement than it is a cultural one. Um, so the basic for international human rights law, which is different than the other two, does anyone remember how? I'm going to check you on this while I'm talking. What's the difference between international human rights and international humanitarian? War. What about it? Huh? It's not good for anything. Um, International humanitarian law is mostly in the context of armed conflict. International human rights law applies regardless, and it's, it's a much bigger. So the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which somebody mentioned here, is actually a big part of that. Um, and the, these three articles that I've actually listed here are the most relevant to the talk of um, religious belief. Um, freedom of belief and freedom from religion. Um, so Article 3 says everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. Um, Article 18, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Um, and then Article 10, everyone is entitled to full equality to a fair and public hearing by an independent and an impartial tribunal. Next slide. So let's get a little bit into what Sharia law is because I don't like talking about things without defining them first. And this is all backed, I have a work cited at the end, just if you think that I just made all this up. Um, 
So the definition of Sharia law, as I take it, is that it's Islam's legal system. Um, it's, it's derived from the Quran, as well as the Word of God, examples of the life of Muhammad, and, and um, rulings by Islamic scholars, the Hadiths, that kind of thing. Um, there are variances in different schools that, um, this was something that um, Kieran was um, talking about earlier in her, her talk too, um, and applications, which I think is really important. Um, I think the application mix is the most important, is that Saudi Arabia, Iran, Kuwait, Bahrain, Yemen, Yemen United Arab Emirates, and the non-state actors like ISIS are all living real examples of how Sharia law has been applied. Um, and there are some differences between state-sponsored Sharia law, which means that the government is actually applying the entire doctrine as their, their form of governments as um, compare, as compare that to um, constitutional references to Sharia law, um, which gives it more of like a dual system instead of just a full-on Sharia law system. And this is something that um, we talk about in the book. Thank you. Okay, next slide. And then Quran and apostasy. Um, I This is only four out of... Lord knows how many. Um, talk about really like what can happen to you if you become an apostate and what's encouraged. And this is only the Quran. There's a, you know a, quite a few um, sources uh, about punishment, about slaying, about never for, like you know forgiving. And you can just imagine what kind of tribunal you'd be in if you had to deal with this kind of um, case law or being this being treated like case law. Next slide. Um, when the UN Declarations of Human Rights came out, there was actually two um, agreement, well, two counter responses to that from the um, Islamic world. And one was the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights, and the other one was the Arab Declaration of Human Rights, which came after the Cairo Declaration. The problem with both of them is that they embodied most of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but it was subject to Sharia law, which kind of defeats the entire purpose. Um, and that's the biggest criticism that I have is that, you know, you are trying to fit in, but at the same time, and you're trying to comply with modern standards of human inter international human rights law, but it's going around in a circle and coming back to Sharia law, which is actually the problem. Next slide. And there's two criticisms that we kind of talked about with Western imposition of Islamic beliefs and also the relative definition of human rights. So that's another criticism that comes from the Islamic world is, well, human rights are different in Islam. And this is something Kieran was talking about as well, is that the labeling actually changes your status within Islam. And that's a problem. And that definitely does not comply with current and modern trends of international human rights. Um, but these are the two main criticisms that I continue to see as a, as a defense of Sharia law in the wake of um, uh, international human rights. I'll take the next slide. 30 seconds. Great, I'm on time. So m this is the response that I would have against any um, criticism that the UN Declaration of Rights actually trump state-sponsored Sharia law is that cultural relativism cannot and does not apply to the relative universality of human rights. So it's just, a, it's a conflict. And in this day and age, we can't tolerate that to an extent when it's, it's you know, we've, we've decided and we've progressed to a point where natural rights um, are what matter the most. Um, the imposition of Sharia law upon the entire population of peoples also violates international human rights in the sense that not everybody in the state can be assumed to have accepted Sharia law or even accepted Islam. So their natural rights are just by virtue being violated when they ha just so happen to be born in an Islamic country. Um, and also that the individual rights should be prioritized over the rights of states, which is another issue with these responses to the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, that the states say that, no, we're gonna, we're gonna determine who gets rights and how they get them. Um, and in this day and age, it should be that the individual um, should be prioritized over the state, that the state is in, in and of itself the one that should have rights, but, all, but actually the individual. Um, and I think that might be the end of it. I just wanted to, yes, there's my work cited. So that's, 
a little bit of a mini summary on those two. Um, I would love to just be able to talk to you guys if you have any questions, because mine is more of a lecture base than anything else. Um, but yes, so that's the case, I think, for having international human rights law trump state-sponsored Sharia law.